My name is Nikki Putanio, and I lecture in the Economics Department at Rhodes University. I'm a course director of Upward alongside Saul Levine from TIPS, Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies in Pretoria. On behalf of Saul and myself, welcome to the launch of the Upward Alumni Network. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished panelists and other speakers, to our scientific committee chair and other scientific committee members attending the launch. Welcome to our Apple lecturers who were able to join. We're delighted to see uh, names like Stephanie Seguino and Mark Bateman on the list, as well as our other guests not associated yet with Apple. Most importantly, we'd like to welcome our Apple alumni, stretching all the way back to 2007. We're very sorry that Christian Kabongo, our Apple uh, project administrator in the past, will be unable to join us as he's busy on assignment in Mali. Just as a bit of background for those of you who are not familiar with Apple, the African Program on Rethinking Development Economics is a high-level training program on development economics that aims to build capacity in economics and economic policy making, taught annually by leading international and African economists. The program provides researchers and policymakers with the tools to critically evaluate the policy options facing governments using evidence-based research and a heterodox perspective that fosters an understanding of the role of government in pursuit of industrialization and economic development, as well as the importance of industrial policy. By looking at the development experiences, both positive and negative, of different regions across the world, as well as cross-cutting themes in economic development, APORD is able to share an alternative perspective that draws on the real-world experiences of development, rather than a simplistic textbook analysis that tries to provide unworkable and sometimes disastrous economic solutions. Lecturers equip participants with key information pertaining to both mainstream and critical approaches. APPORD is an initiative, as most of you know, of the South African Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. The support to date of the Industrial Development Corporation and now going forward of trade of TIPS, Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies. It was started by Nimrod Zalk and Nicola Pons Mignon and functions with the support of an academic scientific committee chaired by Professor Christopher Kramer. Prof Kramer will open the program for us today. And just as a brief introduction, he's the Professor of Political Economy uh, of Development at SOAS at the University of London. He is a former chair of the Center of African Studies at um, <clears throat> the University of London and vice chair of the Royal African Society. Uh, he has taught at Cambridge, at Wada Mundlana University in Mozambique and in South Africa. His recent book, African Economic Development, Evidence Theory and Policy, co-written with John Sender and Arkebe Okube, was published in 2020 and is free to download. I'll ask uh, Chris if he wouldn't mind putting the link in the chat for us. He's worked as a consultant for a range of organizations and is co-editor of another a number of other publications, uh, including the Oxford Handbook on the Ethiopian Economy and the Oxford Handbook of Industrial Policy. So over to you, Chris, for your opening remarks. Thank you. Great. Well, th thank you very much, Nikki. Um, I hope people can can hear me. And 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 you've done done some of some of my job for me. Um, I I'm, I mainly just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, on behalf of the, the Scientific Committee, which it's been my huge pleasure and honour to, to, to serve on and chair for, for some time now. So I wanted to welcome everybody to this launch event and to um, a really enticing panel discussion we have this morning on, on industrial policy. I want to welcome all our Apport alumni and our other guests. When I, when I looked at the, the list yesterday of people registering, I think there was a, a good 30 countries represented there. So that, that says something about our, our reach through airport, I think. And I want to welcome our, our panel speakers, um, and, and I'll come back to, to them in, in a minute. We, 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 just to say that we have 
really an astonishing concentration of um, many years of of experience uh, and insight and thinking. These are not just um, technocratic people, but people who've implemented, but also thought deeply about policy. That is um, the former Minister of Trade and Industry, Rob Davis. That's uh, Arkaby Ogboy, who for many years has, has been a, uh, a minister, a, a special advisor to uh, three prime ministers in a row in, in Ethiopia. And to, to Yemi, to Adeyemi Dipiolo, who's a special advisor uh, on economic policy to, to the vice president and president in, in Nigeria. We really could not have hoped for a better concentration of expertise there for this morning. Um, but I would like more broadly to thank all of those who have supported and, and organized not only this event, but Apple throughout its 15 years uh, since, since it began in, in 2007. I think we've had something like 600 people who've passed through the residential schools of Apple, which is a fantastic thing um, to, to have been part of uh, it, since its origins. So uh, Apple had its origins with, with two SOAS alumni, that was Nicolas Ponsvignon and, and Nimrod Zalk. Um, it was inspired by Hajun Chang's CAPOR, the Cambridge Programme on Rethinking Development Economics, that he ran for, for, for a number of years with Ford Foundation money. And over the years, in South Africa particularly, Apport has been backed by the DTI, not least um, with the huge support of, of the former Deputy Minister and Minister Rob Davis, but also of Garth Strachan, uh, more recently of Dusukizwa, Kimani and, and others. It's been backed by the IDC and there, um, as Nikki said, we, we have huge debt of gratitude to, to Christian Kabongo, who's helped steer the thing for, for, for many years through the IDC. And more recently through TIPS, um, backed by TIPS, with Saul and Baber and, and, and their other colleagues. And um, I would very, very much like to thank Nikki herself, who's put huge effort in over the years to, to organize and juggle the, 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 the demands of the program of, of, of lecturers and so on and, and, and participants. Nikki, Nikki summarized briefly what Apport has tried to be, so I won't repeat that, but we have tried to expose people across the continent and internationally to a range of different heterodox economic ideas but also to build a network. And that's really what we're about today because we've done that through the residential schools, but what today is about is launching this new alumni, the Apport Alumni Network. Um, we, we, we want to build this platform uh, for people to connect horizontally amongst themselves. We want to enrich, strengthen this network of ideas and mutual support and to develop a community of practice, and we hope that contributes to, to policy ideas um, and design in support of uh, sustained growth and structural change and, and addressing the profound challenges of, of employment, of inequalities, of poverty reduction across the continent. Um, I don't want to take up more time. I think we all want to, to hear from our speakers. So, Nikki, shall I pass back to you or, or should we go straight to our panellists? Thanks, Chris. I'll just say a few brief words of introduction um, further to, to your remarks that you've already made. Thanks for your kind comments to the Apple team. Um, and for your wonderful steering of the scientific committee through all these years. Um, all right, so we have this uh, fantastic panel of uh, speakers, and the, the theme of our, our panel discussion is implementing industrial policy, bringing together theory and practice. And I don't think I could think of a, a more, uh, as Chris was saying, um, highly qualified uh, team of speakers to, to address this topic. Just very briefly, I, I would like to make a few remarks. We will share the, the longer uh, bio notes of, of speakers, um, but just to introduce them. Uh, Arkebe Okube is a professor and senior minister who's been at the center of policymaking for over 30 years in Ethiopia. 
He's Professor of Practice at SOAS at the University of London at, and at the University of Johannesburg, a distinguished fellow at the ODI and also a UNU wider honorary research fellow. He has a, a wide array of recent publications, including the book Made in Africa um, and How Nations Learn, Technological Learning, Industrial Policy and Catch-Up, and then the Oxford Handbook series, including uh, co-authorship of Industrial Hubs and Economic Development, Industrial Policy, and the Handbook on um, the Ethiopian Economy. So in addition to that, um, he has uh, served as a board chair of several leading public organizations and uh, international advisory boards and is a recipient of the Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver Star presented by the Emperor of Japan. Prof. Kebe was recognized as one of the most in 100 inf influential Africans of 2016 and a leading thinker on Africa's strategic development. His work uh, focuses on structural transformation, economic catch-up, industrial policy, sustainability, urban transformation, and a number of other areas. He holds a PhD in development studies from SOAS and was an African candidate for the post of Director General of UNIDO. Dr. Rob Davies needs a little introduction um, uh, to you. He's a part-time analyst, writer, and lecturer on matters of African political economy and global trade. Recently appointed as a member of the African Continental Free Trade Area Trade and Advisory Council by the Secretary General. In 2018, he retired after 25 years of service as a member of parliament in South Africa, which included two five-year terms as Minister of Trade and Industry. Before entering parliament in 1994, he held various academic uh, positions, including professor and co-director of the Center for Southern African Studies at UWC and a professor auxiliary at Eduardo Mondlane University in Maputo. Our third speaker is Dr. Adeyemi Dipeolu, who is special advisor to the president, who is special advisor to the president on economic uh, matters in Nigeria and chairs the Fiscal Policy Reforms Committee. He co-chairs the team that produced the new national development plan and is leading a review of national industrial policy. Prior to this, he was with the UNECA, where he held various positions. He earlier served in the Nigerian Foreign um, Service, where he rose to the rank of ambassador, serving in a number of capitals around the, around the world, and as special assistance, assistant for economic policy in the presidency. He studied economics at Ife University and diplomacy at Oxford University. He obtained his MPhil from Cambridge and his doctorate from the University of South Africa. He was confirmed with a, conferred with the fellowship of the Nigerian Economic Society in 2013. So I'd like to ask our panelists each to uh, address the topic for 15 minutes. I'll switch on my camera about two minutes before the 15 minutes is up. And there will be room for discussion um, uh, later in the program to, to um, ask questions of the panelists from the audience after our other speakers have uh, addressed us. All right, so it's over to you, uh, Professor Okabe. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, but let me congratulate uh, uh, those uh, who have been involved in preparing the launch of uh, the Apode Alumni Network, and also all alumni members of Apode. Uh, and as uh, Chris had named, uh, people who have been involved in supporting Apodil, I also would like to join him uh, for their effort. And uh, to my knowledge, Apodil is now 15 years old, uh, which is quite a long time. It has it shows its uh, institutional resilience. And if I'm not uh, uh, wrong. I would say this is the biggest uh, platform uh, that provides alternative uh, policy perspectives 
uh, and heterodox uh, uh, views uh, in uh, uh, development economics. So I congratulate everyone who has contributed to this. I see three achievements uh, of our body. First, its contribution in policy development. Second, its contribution in debates and providing, offering alternative views. And third, also uh, offering as a platform uh, for network and career development, especially alumni members. So coming back to the topic I'll be talking on, uh, the first point is why do we have to talk about industrial policy? Uh, that is usually the conventional understanding is that industrial policy is about government interference, about, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, su support to infant industries. And usually we look at a specific document that mentions and outlines uh, industrial policy. But the real life and the reality is quite different from, uh, uh, from this uh, standard view. Uh, industrial policy is essentially about structural transformation and economic catch-up. Countries that have been able to use creatively industrial policy have been able to promote structural transformation and economic catch-up, and it is supported by economic history. So industrial policy is not about a single document. It's about pattern of actions, pattern of policies, and usually actions are more relevant than what is written on documents. And there is not a single policy document or recipe in terms of this. Having said this, I would like to highlight five points in relation to our understanding to the theory and practice of uh, industrial policy. The first one is uh, industrial policy is not uniform across sectors is not uniform across countries. A significant or the central feature of industrial policy is unevenness and variations in the nature of policies and outcomes. We may see industrial policy where it has been successful in one sector or within a specific sector on a specific stage of the sector's development and a hybrid of outcomes. So it's a very dynamic process. And a central element we understand, and that is so important for learning is the variation and unevenness. This is uh, outlined in many of our academic works and, and empirical evidence. Uh, one, the most latest, uh, the latest one, African economic development, which, uh, uh, has been uh, co-authored with uh, John Sender and, and, and uh, uh, Chris. Uh, so this is the starting point we need to consider. It has relevance in terms of learning from other countries. So the national experience, the national variation, the variation within sectors, depending on the structure of the sector, the linkage dynamics, and the political economy variation is the starting point. The second element is industrial policy is a perspective based on continuous adaptation. It's not static, it's not rigid. We know that global economy is changing. We know that the global value chains and, and globalization of economy uh, activities is shifting, changing. We know that the global governance is changing. So we have mega trends and shifts is changing and industrial policy has to adapt to these uh, international changes. But the change is not only limited to international shifts, it changes also uh, dynamically to local conditions, to industries. It also changes to outcomes linked with policy dynamics. If a specific policy or component of the industrial policy succeeds, it means that it's redundant and it has to be substituted by another element or another component. If it's not successful, it means that it has to be reviewed, lessons taken, and it has to be adapted. 
So the dynamics is a critical element as a policy dynamics involves experiments, learning from failures. So the adaptation is a central, a central feature of industrial uh, policy. The third element I would like to highlight is about the role of the state and market or businesses. The standard understanding is we have governments or states which are then labeled as developmental state or non-developmental state, predatory states. This is the standard understanding on the role of states. But the reality is completely different from this uh, uh, perspective. The role of the state is not rigid. The role of markets and states always has to be complementary to progress uh, forward. What this means is the role of the state varies from sector to sector. The role of the state, if we refer South Africa, in the automotive industry and in the mining sector is not going to be uniform. It's not going to be uniform in a newly evolving industry and uh, an industry, let's say, which is uh, uh, has been established and which has long history. So the role of the state continuously adapts and it requires a lot of adaptation and, and, and corrections. So the role of the state is not static. It changes through stages. It changes uh, and varies among sectors. And the political economy matters a lot in the respective roles of the uh, state and, and the market. And here a critical component is, is not, I mean, the policy to be implemented are not whether the policies are correct or necessary. It's also about understanding the political constraints, uh, whether that policy is possible or whether uh, interest groups allow that, uh, uh, that policy to be implemented. So the success uh, of policies uh, depends on the innovative arrangement between the role of the state and business. And here, it should be clear that the government is not a follower, and the government has to be measured by its productive role. For instance, the discussion on state-owned enterprises usually uh, focus on whether government should be involved in that activity or not. But what matters is, while it's important, to discipline the private sector and businesses. It's also critical that the state is disciplined and the state is measured by its productive contribution. So the productive nature of its, con its uh, contribution is critical. And a critical role of the state is also the dialogue and the collective learning between the state and other uh, social groups, especially industrialists and the private sector. A fourth element I would like to highlight is about the nature of policy making. Industrial policy is about policy making. And here uh, we know that the world of policymakers is usually abstractly understood, and academics don't really understand the challenges, the complexity policymakers have to cope, especially now with a much deeper fragmentation of constituency for policymakers to navigate and to move forward is a huge, a huge challenge. So the policymaking world is full of dilemmas, full of imbalances, full of tensions, and, 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 and uh, this is not usually presented in academic uh, uh, books. So in terms of policy making, for policymakers, it's important to understand that they have to follow a pragmatic approach rather than a dogmatic approach. You don't start from theory or ideology and then try to implement policies. You have to start from understanding the reality and take a pragmatic approach to, uh, to uh, innovating uh, the required uh, policies. But it also needs a strategic perspective. Pragmatic approach would be short, uh, uh, short term. Uh, will have a limited impact if it's not linked with the uh, strategic perspective. And here again, 
even the strategic perspective is not immune from change. It may be adapted in the long run. So a critical element is combining the pragmatic approach and, and also the strategic perspective. A second critical element is learning is central in industrial policy. If you look at those countries that have been quite successful from the 19th century United States to early 20th century Meiji restoration in Japan or the Asian Tigers or recently China, we see a huge commitment in terms of learning, in terms of policy innovation, in terms of experimentation. This is critical for uh, uh, the policy making process. Another element that is linked with policy making is policies have to be supported by researchers, by outputs from think tanks, by policy uh, dialogue. Uh, so the combination, complementarity between research and policy execution is absolutely important for success of uh, industrial policy that is well designed, adapted, and implemented. Lastly, the fifth component I would like to highlight is what does this have, what is the implication of uh, uh, the understanding of industrial policy for Africa? The first thing we need to understand is implementing industrial policy is a complex process because we are talking about structural change of the economy. We are talking about technological culture. We are talking about improving or upgrading the level of the economy. So it cannot be easy. It's a very complex process. So it should not be measured whether a policy is easy or difficult. We know that from the current discussions, even some influential scholars try to advise, don't focus on export because it's too complicated, it's too difficult. But the point is, African countries must embrace and must focus and elevate their efforts to ensure that they are internationally competitive and export capability is absolutely critical for every single country. Without that, the constraints on balance of payment cannot be resolved. Employment is critical for our continent in terms of uh, creating job opportunities, in terms of uh, improving the purchasing power. So this brings us back that economic diversification and productive transformation has to be the single arc objective of African governments. And they need to take practical steps. Among the practical steps that require, that we require priority from my perspective is, first, promoting productive investment. We cannot create jobs. We cannot create export capability out of the blue air. We have to invest, we have to promote productive investment. Productive investment means investment that will uh, is focused on productive capacity, on manufacturing, on agricultural transformation, on high value services sector. So a focus on productive investment is a critical element each African country should aim to focus. A second element is manufacturing and productive activities cannot grow, cannot thrive without industrial ecosystem. So the focus on industrial, on building industrial ecosystem is absolutely important. That's why the understanding of, let's say, industrial parks or special economic zones or technology parks, et cetera, has to be based on uh, a comprehensive understanding on how to develop industrial ecosystems. We also need to give prominence to uh, development of industrial workforce. For many least developing countries or low-income countries, the challenge is not about innovation. The challenge starts from developing uh, industrial workforce. So this requires a focus and also encouraging local forms uh, to develop uh, in the process, as well as domestic linkages. Then I should highlight within this broader uh, African economic uh, transformation, we have to link it with green transformation. 
It's an immense opportunity. The current debate on the global platforms on climate change is, uh, has its own flaws. The rich countries, the polluting economies are not paying for what they are, uh, uh, for their uh, negative contribution to the climate change. And Africa is a victim in this process. It only contributes 3% uh, to uh, uh, climate change or climate uh, collapse. So, however, this is an opportunity to build a green economy. This is an opportunity to build new energy sources. This is an opportunity to build a circular economy. So green transformation should be brought uh, 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 in line with industrial policy. And lastly, industrial policy should not be seen in a narrow way, and it has to be, it has to synergize uh, with the macroeconomic policies. A macroeconomic policy should create conducive environment for productive transformation. Uh, and we cannot uh, achieve industrial policy without infrastructure development that is tuned, that is uh, complementary to industrial policy. Same thing with human resources. We need to expand uh, universities with high quality education. We need to expand technical schools. It's not about primary education from the perspective of industrial policy. So the human resource element and the institutions should be critical. And finally, I should also mention that industrialization is complementary with urbanization. So a critical challenge for policymakers is, as the Africa is going to go through a highway of urbanization, how can we create a healthy uh, trend of urbanization that provides that complements industrial policy is going to be important. These are the points I would like to highlight and thank you very much for uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. And I would like to congratulate all alumni and also institutions that has been backing up for the DTI, IDC, TIPS, the Apport team, scientific committee, and I should mention also a few individuals with your permission. Rob Davis has played a critical role, uh, Nimrod, uh, Nicholas, uh, and Saul at the uh, tips, uh, Christian and Nikki, uh, and all others who've contributed to this initiative. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, platform uh, because this is the single and largest uh, uh, platform that provides alternative perspectives. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, RKB, for that incredibly, not only for your kind words, but also for that incredibly insightful analysis of the critical elements of industrial policy. Um, and uh, particularly, I was thinking of on the implications for Africa, it would be very interesting, and perhaps um, Rob Davies will pick up on this, of the um, in the context of our African continental free trade area going forward, how we can bring in this very strong need for this uh, industrial policy aspect and how critically important it is to marry this with the AFCFTA uh, on the continent. So I'd like to uh, pass over then to uh, to Rob Davies to give his input. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nikki. And let me also um, just uh, join uh, Akebi and others in uh, congratulating uh, Apport for this initiative. I think that uh, we all think of Apport as a very uh, important program, and we're glad that it's uh, survived for uh, quite a long time, and we wish uh, it's uh, all the good fortune as it moves ahead. What I'm going to do is I've got some slides and I'm, I'm going to, to try to um, theorize a little from the practice that I was involved in when we were trying to implement industrial policy during my time in government. Um, and um, I've done it in the form of, say, 10 things which uh, I think uh, I have learned uh, from uh, our efforts to try to implement industrial policy in South Africa uh, from uh, 2009 to 2019. I'm decidedly not trying to say that there's a model here that uh, others can follow because many of the lessons are from the shortcomings and the weaknesses 
of our industrial policy, not uh, uh, just uh, strength, because if it was uh, a, a program that was just uh, implementable in, in, uh, in every other jurisdiction, we'd have to be saying that it had led to a new growth path based on productive sectors leading the way and with a reduction of poverty, inequality and unemployment, which is clearly not the case. Um, I'm also not going to offer any kind of comprehensive assessment of uh, the circumstances. Um, we did this collectively from time to time in the various uh, industrial policy action plans. And I put some of my own views forward in um, a, uh, a volume I, I published last year. Uh, so um, I've put it 10 things. And if we go to the next slide, please, um, you'll see that I am, um, I, uh, next slide, please. Um, sorry, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm decidedly uh, borrowing shamelessly from uh, Ha Jun Chang's uh, uh, book, Three Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. I've only got 10 things. Um, and uh, the thing one, uh, I'm not going to try to argue the case for industrial policy, the need for it. And, uh, uh, I think that we already heard from um, you know, one of Africa's foremost uh, thinkers on industrial policy, uh, Arkebi, uh, and also those who are alumni of uh, uh, Ford must surely not be uh, uh, needing to, to be persuaded of the imperative and necessity uh, for structural changes and moving uh, into uh, higher value added activities. But I do want to say, and this is the first point I'm making, is that I think that a successful industrial policy does depend on uh, this industrial policy being seen very widely in society as something which is a priority. Uh, in South Africa, I don't think it was seen like that. I don't think it still is. Uh, in business, the biggest and most influential sector is the financial sector. And I think its claims and, and demands are much more influential uh, in shaping many policies than those of industrial uh, development. Uh, and um, I think that uh, it also needs to be seen as a, a priority development program by government. Uh, I don't think it was during our time. It was seen as one of, of several uh, uh, possible uh, routes to, uh, uh, to development. So the second slide, please. Uh, the second thing I think that needs to, to, to happen for successful industrial policy is that, <clears throat> uh, the next slide, please. Sorry, I'm not working this. Yeah, is that is that in uh, uh, as as Akabi was saying, industrial policy needs to be the product of extensive consultations uh, with industrialists. Uh, I would also add with organised labour. In the in our experience, I think that the Clothing Textile Workers Union, uh, the National Union of, Mine, uh, of, of Metal Workers, uh, were, were were quite critical uh, in, in in shaping aspects of of sectoral programmes. Um, but also I want to, to, as he did, to, to draw in the importance of a research component uh, in guiding uh, those discussions. Um, and I want to just give the example that um, the, the first uh, master plan, uh, which we developed, master plans are now the, uh, the, the sort of main uh, driver of uh, the current uh, uh, reimagined industrial policy being pursued by the Department of Trade, uh, Industry and, Cooper and, and Competition now. But the first of these was uh, in the auto sector. And um, the researcher was quite critical in identifying appropriate international practice, what was going on in other jurisdictions, and drawing our attention to things and measures which could actually assist in, 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 in uh, advancing our own uh, automotive industry, uh, also identifying weaknesses of our own compared to other jurisdictions. And I think that input was very, very important in guiding the discussion, because I think that it's important that, that this discussion and interactions <clears throat> between government uh, um, and uh, uh, other stakeholders uh, needs, needs not to be one where where, where uh, you know, you're going in just and listening to a series of demands and, and uh, requests coming from industrialists, some of which can be short-term uh, rent-seeking, 
uh, in nature or actually in conflict with those of uh, other industrialists. Uh, and here, we, you know, you have to, to make decisions about whether you're going to, uh, how or how you are going to balance the demands, let's say, the motor industry of assemblers and component manufacturers uh, in uh, other industries of upstream and downstream uh, users and so on. And I think if you, if you, if you don't go in a, a researched, focused uh, kind of uh, uh, assessment to begin the discussion, uh, quite often you will just end up confronting a list of demands, some of which uh, may be contradictory. And I do think that uh, uh, given, uh, I think the, the very often the, the companies uh, are, are not that strategic in their thinking. And I think that this leads me to think that one of the very important divisions of labor and I take the point, I think it's, 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 it's correct that uh, you need a disciplined state and a state that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, able to, to, to have a, a degree of capacity. Uh, but I think that, that, that the, the, the vision of labor is that the, is that the state really has to take the strategic leadership role. Uh, and uh, it then uh, is obviously trying to mobilize uh, the private sector uh, in, 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 in a particular direction, but it can only do this uh, by confronting the realities and getting to know uh, the realities on the ground. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think Okebi already said this very much more eloquently than I'm going to, but I think that it's, it's very much the case that industrial policy needs to be recognized as a process of learning by doing. Uh, experimentation, innovation uh, is, uh, uh, is, is very much a part of the game. Uh, and there must be, along with this, a willingness to constantly monitor and review uh, the measures that are implemented. And uh, this is a difficult one as well, but uh, to uh, um, when uh, something is not working uh, or uh, is uh, achieving some perverse results, uh, to be willing to go back to the drawing board, uh, rethink and uh, implement uh, in uh, a different way. So I think that the, the learning by doing uh, is very much uh, at the heart of industrial policy. Uh, thing four, next slide, please. Um, I think that any kind of incentives, be they financial incentives or be they uh, things like uh, regulatory incentives, I think that there must, it, it's always something of trying to develop a, a quid pro quo from the side of those that are going to benefit. And this quid pro quo would be I think uh, in, the, in the form of investment required, competitiveness, employment, uh, or in terms of upstream industries, procurement from local sources and so on. Um, and that there must also then be a willingness to withdraw whatever incentives are in place if uh, these are not delivered on. So clear milestones, that's the sort of ideal type. But then I think that we also have to recognize the reality uh, of the balance of forces. Uh, I mean, quite often you will get confronted with, uh, uh, and I don't think they, 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 they're misleading us, it's sometimes the truth, uh, that uh, investments are uh, a matter of intercompany competitive uh, competition when it comes to uh, uh, multinational companies. Uh, they're having to compete with, uh, you know, the, the, the local operations having to compete with the operation in other jurisdictions for the, uh, uh, the, the project. And uh, quite often they'll come to you and say that, well, in, if we don't get the maximum, we aren't going to be able to compete. Uh, and I think those are, those are, it's part of the reality of the balance of forces. But I think as far as possible, uh, incentives must, must be against uh, defined uh, uh, obligations and defined milestones uh, that you need uh, to achieve. Uh, the next slide, please. I think that industrial policy has to be recognized as a cross-cutting national priority that requires uh, coordinated actions by several state as well as other actors. Uh, I'm focusing on the state actors because I think it's uh, quite important that, um, you know, uh, many of the biggest challenges that, 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 that I think that, 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 that um, we had during our time is that we were uh, dealing with peers uh, in charge of other departments. They were not um, under us or anybody you could go and give an order to. They were your, your, your equals. Um, and that um, uh, if industrial policy is just one in an extensive list of programs, which is what I think was the case uh, during our time, um, then uh, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. And I think that was very much uh, the case in our time. 
And um, if then on top of that, individual entities uh, operating in their silos can decide on the extent to which they will or more likely will not uh, act to support industrial policy, uh, then the impact of industrial policy is weakened. Of course, in our time as well, uh, there was the impact of state capture and corruption. So many of the non-implementation of important measures of industrial policy uh, in the end derive from some uh, nefarious interest uh, in some other entity uh, and uh, not uh, just a, a general lack of willingness. But I think the, the broader point is, is there must be some mechanism uh, with appropriate authority uh, that can manage the coordination of a range of actions that are required across different entities uh, in, in, in government. The next thing, please. And this is linked to the, the previous point. The sixth thing is that there, there has to be an alignment uh, between industrial policy and other aspects of economic policy. Uh, and I'm saying here in particular industrial policy must shape and influence decisions on macroeconomic policy. I don't think this happened in South Africa. I don't think this is happening now in South Africa. Uh, but um, uh, there were a number of instances about when the, whether the exchange rate was suitable in supporting exports of value-added products or doing the opposite, uh, whether uh, uh, a, 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 an austerity kind of program uh, is compatible with uh, industrial policy. I think these are all really important issues. Uh, procurement policy whether procurement is going to be uh, supporting localization, local manufacturing, uh, uh, another critical question. Uh, infrastructure, I think, as uh, Akebi already mentioned, and skills development, among other things. Uh, all of these, I think, need to be influenced and shaped to a greater extent uh, uh, than uh, was the case, and still is the case, I would argue, in South Africa, uh, by uh, industrial policy. The seventh thing is that uh, this is something which I think is, is, is uh, a very, very important, but also very, very difficult, uh, is that uh, successful industrial policy, uh, I would argue, depends on the taming of financialization. Um, and um, this uh, is uh, something that I, uh, from the literature I've read on China, I think they managed to achieve, uh, uh, but many of the rest of us, are facing financial sectors uh, which are not only growing, and in the case of South Africa, I point out that the financial services sector grew from about, actually the figure should be 6%, not 4% of the GDP in 1994, to over 20% by the mid-2010s. This wasn't just growth of a sector. It also reflected financialization. And Gerald Epstein's uh, classic definition says the increasing role of financial motors financial markets, financial actors, financial institutions in the operation of domestic and international economies. And there's another quote from Angtad, which I'm not going to read out, but uh, they basically say the 90s, banking stopped being boring, but also stopped to serving the needs of the productive economy. And that uh, the industry came uh, along with financial deregulation and the surge of cross-border actions. It basically changed from uh, creating, uh, from providing finance to other sectors to an originate and distribute business model whereby loans were, were turned into other financial products and there was a whole uh, uh, labyrinth of trading that took place uh, and that uh, uh, in, in effect uh, uh, this meant that uh, financial uh, sectors were to a decreasing extent um, providing services to productive sectors. And this was very much we also know that, um, that, 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 that uh, financialization was not limited uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the operations of, uh, of, of uh, companies uh, in the financial sector, uh, narrowly understood. Um, there, 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 there was a, a, a volume uh, recently released that, uh, uh, on South Africa, uh, industrial policy in South Africa, which actually pointed out that through a case study of, of companies like uh, Cecil and, uh, and, and uh, ShopRite Checkers, uh, which showed that, that the extensive financialization was taken over there. And I think what this means is it means that immediately um, the financing of industrial development uh, requires the building and strengthening of development finance institutions. I think that's the, uh, the, uh, the bigger uh, takeout that I, I would draw from that. The eighth thing, the next slide, please. Um, 
I think there must be a clear understanding of, of, of the market for value-added products. So uh, Akebi has already said, and he's, he's quite right about that, exporting is, 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 is a critical dimension of building competitiveness. But where, they, where are the products that are to be exported to? And I think that while there are some opportunities for some products, you know, must take advantage of a go as long as it exists. Uh, you know, if there are opportunities in the European Union, you know, take advantage of it. But I think that there, there's there's no real prospect of following Asia or China of a, a deep industrialization in Africa being based on the production of finished manufacturing products to the developed world. I think that time has passed. Uh, there's a reaction in the developed world. Uh, their idea that they could uh, uh, move into what's called a post-manufacturing phase uh, uh, of uh, services and financial services, uh, that started to dissipate at the time of the, of the Great Recession. And I think that those countries are, are now all recovering their own uh, industrial policies and trying to rejuvenate their own industrial sectors. And that's leading, leading to a greater reluctance to accept finished products, not just from China, by the way. China is often a, a bellwether uh, for uh, a, a range of developing countries. I think digitization is also reducing the prospects of us competing for low-wage basic manufacturing. Um, we've already seen cases where uh, Adidas moved move production back to Germany uh, because it said that robotization and other digitization uh, were, bit, were, were, were more, be, were, were more cost-cutting uh, to it uh, than low wages in, in, in Bangladesh. And so I think that with uh, our domestic markets obviously being too small to support deep industrialization, the best prospect is to take up the, the point that was raised by Nikki, um, is that uh, the best prospect, I think, immediately is a more integrated African market uh, through the African continental free trade area. That's thing eight. And then thing nine, I'm taking the point to say that I think that um, the continental free trade area cannot be approached simply as an opportunity for a few slightly more industrialized countries on the continent to offload finished consumer goods. Nor can it be seen as an opportunity for maybe other countries on the continent to host screwdriver type assembly of products uh, coming from third countries uh, whose main value added actually comes from outside. So I think the best prospects lie in a more inclusive development of regional value chains and a greater trade in intermediate products, which is what is actually the biggest uh, and fastest growing part of international trade. And um, the building of these regional value chains is now a real opportunity. It's the direction supported by the Secretariat of the Continental Free Trade Area and also endorsed uh, by uh, the heads of state. So I think that uh, the uh, priority sectors, if uh, uh, they're not well known, uh, are automotives, uh, it's uh, um, um, agriculture and agro-processing, uh, it's transport equipment, and it's pharmaceuticals and uh, medical devices. And... Um, I think that there's a real opportunity for us to build value chains there, as well as I think uh, myself, I, I would agree about the uh, critical importance of the transition to a lower carbon economy, uh, which is being brought on by the uh, threat of catastrophic climate change. And that I think that we also need to be uh, looking at this as a mega challenge, uh, but also uh, at what we can do to be able to uh, uh, produce value-added products that are going to be used in, for example, the generation uh, of renewable energy. The tenth and last thing is, I think that we must be willing to defend our use of industrial policy tools against the claims of extra-regional, I put it in inverted commas, trading partners. Um, this means that we must design our own rules to give a real priority in the continental free trade area to products with value addition on the continent. So um, we, we see as we move into this uh, uh, continental free trade area, there's no end of uh, so-called trading partners that now want this to be matched with free trade areas towards them, see this as a step towards uh, free trade. Uh, and if this happens, then uh, we will not be giving the requisite uh, benefits to uh, value-added products on the continent. It also means, though, that we must fight against proposals in multilateral trading system and other, and, 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 uh, uh, other, other rules that would undermine our industrial policy space. 
So i am just uh, cite a few of them, but there are many of them, I think, that come up. But uh, sound nice, uh, sound useful, but if you unpack them, uh, they would decom decommission important uh, policy tools. So, for example, the WTO protocol on transparency in government procurement. Uh, this is not just about transparency. Transparency means something more than that. It means actually that you would be giving all other signatories uh, equal uh, to uh, your procurement decisions, and it would mean that you would decommission uh, the possibility of uh, using local procurement by government uh, as a tool to support uh, uh, local industries. Um, any of the rules on the so-called digital two dozen, uh, which are being uh, promoted, have been promoted uh, by uh, the developed world uh, for uh, trade in uh, um, uh, digital products, uh, this would uh, uh, have a similar impact. As with trade in environmental goods, uh, if we sign on to agreements of trade in environmental goods as they've been currently tabled, uh, they would amount to saying that you cannot uh, insist on any preferences for uh, locally produced uh, uh, wind towers, uh, components of uh, 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 renewable uh, energy generation, and, and so on. And then I think we also have to, to, to take very seriously uh, these, these, this question of intellectual property uh, as we design our own approach to intellectual property in the continental free trade area, because many of the TRIPS plus proposals, which are promoted bilaterally, as well as many, many of the TRIPS rules themselves, uh, I would argue have gone beyond uh, a reward for innovation. Uh, they're actually now in the realm, I think, as we've seen uh, in the whole case of vaccine apartheid as a license uh, for uh, monopoly conduct. So I think that how we define our own position on these issues in the, con in the continental context, within the continental free trade area, as well as how we position ourselves in uh, multilateral uh, and bilateral uh, negotiations, I think will be critical. So let me leave it at that point and say uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Thanks very much, uh, Rob, for those uh, wonderful insights, drawing both on uh, your extensive research and knowledge, as well as the practical experience um, under industrial policy in, uh, as Minister of Trade and Industry. I think that the last point on the last slide is really critical as the continental free trade area will move um, going forward, we'll be moving into looking at how to deal with these new issues like intellectual property, investment and, and so forth. I think it's an amazing opportunity for the continent to look at the synergies between industrial development and intellectual property protection, industrial development and government procurement, industrial development and competition policy, and uh, we must kind of seize the moment to get it right in the AFCFTA as we move into the phase two negotiations in, in, in the near future. All right, so I'd like to hand over now to Adeyemi Depeolu, and um, hopefully uh, Yemi will also pick up on some of these issues related to the AFCFTA. And uh, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nikki. And um, I join the two previous speakers in uh, congratulating the organizers of this event, as well as members of the um, APPORD network uh, for the launch of the network today. I, I think uh, Dr. Akabe and Dr. Davis have spoken from different perspectives about some of the things I, wa I want to highlight. Um, of course, um, industrialization, we all know, is very important for Africa, um, especially for rapid growth, for structural transformation, uh, for diversification and reduction of in commodity dependence. Um, <clears throat> of course, for theoretical and empirical reasons as well, it is clear to us, at least to members of this network, that African countries cannot achieve rapid industrialization without a clear industrial strategy or government policies to stimulate specific economic activities in order to bring about structural change. But my starting point today is to say that um, the pathway to industrial policy is not as straightforward as that, and that um, 
I think in many ways, industrial policy uh, still has a lot of enemies and has to confront a lot of ideological giants. Uh, for instance, we all know, uh, talking about old enemies, um, that the neoliberal view that sees government failure uh, abounding in, in so many interventions and thus the banishment of uh, industrial policy during the era of structural adjustment. Um, then of course, there's the, when the weight of argument showed that this was not necessarily the case, and we then moved to being told that um, structural change um, did not need specific policies, but rather um, horizontal policies, uh, policies would do as well. Um, this, of course, these views were not very helpful in the sense that if you have scarce resources, every intervention necessarily favors some activities over others. So you build a railroad uh, from uh, point A to point B to evacuate metal products. Um, it's a choice between building uh, a road from an agriculturally productive sector to the ports. The point being that um, even horizontal policies when applied uh, always have a specific uh, objective. Then the other issue that tends to arise when discussing industrial policy in Africa is the historical experience of the post-independence era uh, when um, African countries went for rapid industrialization to reduce their reliance, of course, on uh, the colonial masters, but also um, acting on the lines of the previous single hypothesis uh, that the primary commodities, um, that in terms of trade of primary commodities would deteriorate uh, the secular decline in their prices over time. Um, so of course, a lot of African countries tried import substituting industrialization um, with some initial success. Um, so you found that the share of manufacturing in GDP rose from about 6.3% um, in the 60s uh, to about 15% by 1990. However, by 2010, that share had fallen to 10% um, as compared to 35% in Asia, while manufacturing uh, value added in the continent was about $100 per head as compared to $600 in Brazil and $800 in China. So the, the, the point I'm making is that there was um, an industrialization, it failed due to the trip liberalization policies of the structural adjustment. Um, it failed also because of structural balance of payment constraints and Dr. Akabe made reference to that. But it also failed and the point also came up in both uh, presentations because of lack of reciprocal control mechanisms, which I think was Alice and then term for pointing out that um, um, you needed to be able to extract uh, results uh, from people who benefited from incentives. But the points I really want to make today are that in addition to these old enemies, these two old enemies of um, the neoliberal hypothesis and the, uh, and the and the poor empirical performance of industrialization in Africa. I think essentially is that there are several, and I call them modern day giants that most African countries have to overcome. So I would agree that some of our countries may have overcome them, but I think the bulk of them continue to, bulk of the African countries continue to face this, um, these challenges. And I think the first is that there is a continued dominance of neoliberal thinking in the marketplace of ideas. In other words, the ideas that are available to African policy makers <clears throat> are really by and large, um, the ideas that come from the financial reach of the Washington consensus institutions, um, and as well as uh, the education that took place at that time. So a lot of policy makers and political leaders uh, still tend to design their policies in ways and means that will meet the approval of the Bretton Woods institutions. Now, um, this is important and I illustrate it from an example in Nigeria, where we have a fairly good Nigerian uh, industrial revolution plan, which was adopted in 2014. It's fairly good to the extent that it recognized the importance of sectoral, sectoral industrial policies, but it then went on to hinge implementation on, pro, on a general incentive approach of the investment climate. In other words, um, at the end of the day, it was still thinking of horizontal policies, uh, despite the fact that it recognized the importance of specific uh, uh, policies. 
And of, similarly, in the same context, we have what I call the pioneer incentive scheme uh, in Nigeria, which has infant industry uh, origins. But then looking at it and to adopt it as recently as 20, uh, or revised as recently as 2017, um, it has a six to incentivize um, 99 sectors, uh, which I think uh, takes away the whole uh, purpose of trying to have selective industrial policies. The second area of concern today, I think, is the loss of policy space arising, and this point was made by Dr. Davis in a different way. He's even talking about the more current um, challenges, but I'm even saying that the previous changes are still very much with us um, in international economic relations, especially at the WTO. So as the late Sanjay Lau put it, and I quote him, one effect of these changes has been to construct policies had been to constrict policies used to promote industrial development. The most affected are protection of infant industries, performance requirements and on foreign investors, export targeting and incentives and other subsidies um, affecting trade and, uh, and the like, including IPRs for promoting copying and reverse engineering, as well as the use of local content rules. So the point I'm making there is that so the policy space has shrunk is the international economic relations have been redesigned and it's gonna be very difficult for the individual African country to try and find its way out of, uh, out of those rules, um, which, which for instance, if you are felt to have uh, breached, uh, could attract retaliatory uh, measures. And I think a third area of concern is uh, domestic politics. And again, this came out, I think. Um, I think that in the first instance, there's a high level of effort uh, required in the process of learning uh, um, in order to over, uh, um, bring about industrialization. Uh, but in most African countries, it's very difficult to enforce reciprocal control mechanisms. In other words, despite the fact that protection can only succeed if it's accompanied by competitive pressures on firms, we'll find that in several African countries, and this has been stressed earlier, and indeed in several poor locations, um, that without the ability to extract performance, uh, industrial policy may just end up as uh, allocating rents uh, to the more powerful. Uh, similarly, I think uh, even when you try to branch out, and this point came out in a different way through the, uh, the example of financialization, that where you even try to deepen industrial policy, you may find that those who have a greater interest in other sectors like the finance sector can actually slow down attempts uh, to deepen uh, industrial policy. Other issues, of course, that continue to uh, uh, plague an attempt to move to industrial policy uh, in Africa would include, for instance, the emergence of global value chains. They may have their uses, but entry is very difficult. And clearly, um, if African countries are not careful, they will find themselves at the lower end of those value chains, basically still as the primary commodity uh, producers. And I end um, on this, in this part by saying that the, there are limited administrative capacities in most African countries. This is partly due, of course, to low salaries, partly due to a lack of training opportunities, uh, partly due to not knowing what the latest thinking is. But the critical thing, I think, is that where those things happen, um, it's very difficult to use public policy uh, to change the direction of an economy. But I think all hope is not lost. And I think that uh, it is possible uh, for African countries to adopt transformative industrial policies, uh, which uh, 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 I see Nikki has turned up, I'll just round up very soon, <laughs> just to say that, um, they can adopt transformative industrial policies that we must uh, tackle um, the marketplace of ideas through programs like APORT. Um, this is a very good opportunity to tackle the marketplace of ideas. We must push the boundaries of policy space uh, through national strategic thinking, um, using tax benefits, R&D incentives, things that are not uh, affected by the WTO. We must develop administrative competencies and insulate our bureaucracies from political pressures. To say this is not possible, of course, is to argue that development is not possible at all. But by and large, I end by saying, I think the key role of political leadership, I think, has been made clear 
by the two previous speakers, but it's something that must be taken into account. So I'll leave it there for now, just to say that um, I'm happy to have been here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I look forward to engaging more um, with, um, with uh, the Apple Network, where I have already given lectures. And incidentally, I was an alumnus of Capod. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Yemi. Uh, that was great. Um, thank you for your important highlighting of the continuing challenges to industrial policy, particularly as you put it in the marketplace um, of ideas. So I think a very kind of a sobering um, a talk to, to end off with. And also the, the um, dispelling the myth that industrial policy may be difficult to do, so therefore it shouldn't be done which of course is one of the, one of the great um, myths that we are often told um, instead of you know, building the capacity to do it. So yes, it does speak to the importance of programs like Appboard in, um, in this uh, battle for the marketplace of ideas. All right, we will have an opportunity to address the questions in the chat and to address the um, <clears throat> other questions that the audience may have after we have um, asked our, our, our last couple of speakers to give their input, their brief inputs. And I just would like to um, hand over to Saul to address us very briefly on, on the launch itself. And then uh, we will come back to, to the questions, as I say. Thank you very much to our, our wonderful panel for their uh, excellent and uh, thought-provoking inputs. Saul. So. Thanks, Nikki. Um, thanks also to the panel. Um, it's a good way to launch this alumni network and to um, highlight some of the, the issues that we cover in a board. Um, the, the purpose of the network, I think, which has already been spoken about today, is to build on um, what has become an important program in how we think about African economic development and how do we take it forward. Um, the, the purpose of the network is we, we've got to a point in the program where it's, it's about 600 people who've either been through the program or have been lecturing on the program. And we felt that um, we, we've actually got a really um, good platform to build connections to share information um, and, and to use the, um, the, the learnings that we, we've acquired during a board um, to take forward um, you know, Af African economic development um, in, in a meaningful way. So the, the launch um, event today, I think has been a great event um, with some excellent insights being shared. And we look at doing more of this. Um, we, we want to use the network um, to hold events from time to time, to share information. We've already put up the LinkedIn page, which many people have joined in. Um, tips from our side, we'll be posting uh, some of our research and events as well. But also it's an opportunity for members of the network to share their own research, their own think thinking, um, ideas, and um, you know, information that they think is useful um, for the network, but also for connections to be made. Maybe there's a chance to collaborate between colleagues um, between the different years um, and to, to be able to um, you know, join in that, that broader um, network of people who, who've been able to um, be, go, go through the program and able to share their insights. Um, uh, we, we're also going to be um, sharing some of the port information. So we've got um, uh, the, the lectures that we've recorded. Um, some of those are available um, both on the website and, and through the uh, alumni site. So it's apport.co.za, um, which I think Nikki's shared um, on, on the chat. And then um, also um, the team that was working on the um, podcasts um, that, that we um, had so Nimrod and Nicola um, had collaborated and Chris as well to develop some podcasts, um, which we will be releasing soon and we'll be posting those um, insights on, onto the alumni network. So um, onto the LinkedIn page and, and the, um, uh, the web page. Um, and then it's also um, an opportunity to 
you know, collaborate. Um, maybe there's projects that you want to do differently or together um, and, and contact colleagues um, through, through the LinkedIn page um, and um, host your own events. Um, so it's not just about um, us driving it. We will be actively involved to make sure that um, there's regular updates and, and new content all the time, but also for people to share their, um, their own insights. So the alumni become part of the network and start to own it as well. Um, thank you. That's it from my side. Um, and back to you, Nikki. Thanks very much, Saul. That's great. I'd like to... Uh... Hand over now to um, Zukiso Kimani to say something about the 2022 uh, call for applications for the Apple program. Uh, Zukiso is the Chief Director in the Industrial Competitiveness and Growth Branch of the South African Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. She's been working in the industrial policy environment for over 15 years responsible for managing, evaluating, and developing South Africa's in industrial policy, inclusive of the previous Industrial Policy Action Plan, and more recently, the reimagined industrial strategy. She's also responsible for the design and development of mar marine manufacturing and interventions, as well as oversight of aerospace and defense. She is responsible for overseeing research undertaken by the ICCG branch to ensure policy formulation and is that is evidence-based and industrial policy capacity building programs such as Apple. So she's our very important uh, contact and um, uh, a person with the, the DTIC and has been a fantastic support to the program uh, along the way. She also um, serves on various boards, panels, and investment adjudication committees. She holds a master's degree in international development economics from the Australian University, Australian National University. Over to you, Zukiswa. Welcome. South African in uh, industrial development and is professor of economics at the University of Johannesburg. She holds a PhD in economics from Cambridge University and is a part-time member of the Co Competition Tribunal and serves on numerous boards and um, advisory panels and councils, including the Presidential Economic Advisory Council. So um, thanks, Fiona, for uh, introducing this important aspect of the work of Apport and over to you. Um, thanks, Nikki. Um, great to be here. Um, I'll be really quick. Um, it's really just to share information uh, this year's around this year's Tandikam Kandawera prizes. I'm very excited that we've we've opened these prizes, uh, opened the call uh, last week for these prizes. Um, it's the second year in which we are, are running these awards um, after the inaugural call um, last year. Um, the late uh, Tandikam Kandawera was, of, of course, um, one of the, the, the leading um, African scholars working on issues of um, African economic development, um, who made uh, seminal contributions on, on a range of topics, um, including social policy, industrialization, and so on. Um, and he, he taught at Airport for, uh, for many years, including delivering the Alice Amson Memorial Lecture in 2017. Um, so the, the call, I believe, has already been um, distributed um, to, uh, um, to everybody here. Um, but I have just posted in, in the chat, uh, again, the, the link to the call in case anyone um, hasn't received it. Um, so basically, uh, these awards are to recognize um, outstanding scholarship um, by African scholars. Um, and uh, we are awarding prizes in two categories, uh, the Open Award um, for Outstanding Scholarship and uh, an award for young scholars um, who need to be under 40 years um, of age. And the awards are made on the basis of a, of a research paper. Um, and the total uh, value of the, of the prize money this year is uh, $12,500. Um, looking at the time, I'm not going to go into, into further details. Um, they are there in the, in the call as to eligibility and, and the criteria and, and so on. Um, let me just highlight that the, 
uh, the deadline for submissions um, of the full papers is the 22nd of May. Um, and we really, really uh, welcome and encourage um, submissions um, from the Apoid uh, Alumni Network. Um, I, I, I think some of you will have been uh, in the lectures that uh, Tandika gave at, at Apoid. And I think there are many people um, in the network and on this call who are working on um, issues that are, are really relevant uh, to the themes of, of, the, of the awards. Um, so really encourage you to, to submit um, and also to, to share the, um, the call through your networks um, and uh, looking forward to, to seeing the submissions. Let me leave it there. Thanks very much, Fiona. Um, I would strongly encourage everyone to uh, read through the call. We had a fantastic um, a prize winner last year, who the Young Scholar uh, Prize winner who joined the Apple program and gave a, a, a great presentation of her, her paper. I think she's also with us today in the meeting, Julia. Um, I think, um, uh, let me just hand over to Saul. Thanks, Nikki. Um, and sorry, we couldn't hear from you, Zukiswa, but I'll um, assist uh, from our side. Just to say that we've... Um, just opened the um, call for applications for APOR 2022. We are looking at holding an in-person uh, APOR this year. Last year was um, a virtual seminar, um, and we are excited that we um, are able to now do it in person. we have um, looking at a venue in Pretoria, um, just to give it a, a slight change from previous years where it's been held in Santon. Um, and We've um, busy organizing the lineup of um, lecturers um, and trying to make sure that it's an interesting and engaging accord as always. Um, so the, if people can circulate um, the call for participants um, to your networks, um, we, we've got it through the Apport website, apport.co.za. Um, if you're able to um, um, the um, join in and um, or send it if you if you haven't attended a board um, and would like to there's an application form online to complete with a number of documents to upload if you have been part of a board um, previously please send out the link um, we do close on the morning of the 3rd of May so we've still got um, some time for people to apply um, as most of you who've been on a board know um, there is limited numbers that we can take. Um, so we, we look to between 30 to 35 um, applicants each year um, who are able to join us. Um, so it is a bit tough to get in, but um, definitely worthwhile. And um, the support from the DTRC uh, means that we are able to cover costs of the participants um, who are able to, um, who are successful in joining. Um, I'll, we'll put in the link to the website um, on the um, chat. Thanks, um, Zukiswa. I'm sure you would have added more, um, but I'll, I've just covered the basics um, on, on the launch. Thanks. Um, all right. We, we have uh, not much time left, but we uh, would very much like to give an opportunity to our alumni for uh, input, either generally um, about the airport experience, but first of all, to uh, address some of the questions that were put directly to our panelists. I'm just scrolling back on the chat, and I have uh, two questions here in the chat. Uh, that are related, that have been put, um, addressed to, to Rob, but I think our Kebe, I think, had to leave for another engagement, but um, was to please unpack the relationship, this was to Rob Davies, the relationship between industrial policy and macroeconomic policy, both in terms of the direct fiscal support required and the broader macroeconomic posture, which is required to generate conditions for industrial development and diversification. Can the other nine things in your presentation work without this macroeconomic thing? And then in addition, and how does the changed international economic situation post the COVID crisis impact on the relationship between macro and industrial policy? So if I could ask first uh, Rob to respond, and then uh, if either of the other panelists want, wish to add. 
Well, let me let me say I I um, agree, and I think that um, uh, the issue is put um, uh, more crisply uh, by uh, Adeyemi um, when he spoke about the the continuing uh, influence of neoliberalism. And I think that the continuing influence of neoliberalism, well, uh, originally, of course, uh, industrial policy was completely demonized, and now it's kind of more conditionally accepted by neoliberalism. But nonetheless, it still holds that the the priority is the achievement of uh, certain predetermined macroeconomic balances, regardless of uh, the conditions in the real economy. And so, you know, it's telling us that uh, your level of, uh, of debt cannot exceed uh, uh, 60% of your GDP, uh, your, ba- your budget deficit should not exceed 3% and so on and so forth. And I think that in practice, what this has meant, particularly in the light of the, uh, of the uh, COVID uh, great lockdown recession, uh, is it meant that uh, we have uh, adopted uh, contractionary um, macroeconomic policies. And I think they have a, a massive, massive implication uh, in terms of the uh, ability to achieve the kind of structural transformations that uh, are necessary. Uh, and um, we've had um, vaccine apartheid, I already mentioned it, followed by what Ankh had called, uh, again using a South African term, uh, recovery separate development, where the developed world spent um, upwards of 20% of its GDP on recovery programs. And uh, the poorest, least developed countries spent less than 1% of their much smaller GDPs on recovery. So what we've got is we've got a very uh, uh, unequal and uneven recovery, which uh, has now been exacerbated by the uh, the situation of the war in Ukraine. And we know what that's going to do for uh, oil prices, maybe quite good for the oil producers, but uh, very uh, difficult for the rest of us. Uh, food prices around the world are going to go up, uh, and there's going to be a, a you know much much more uncertainty in the in the global economy. And if we don't have expansionary policies, then I think that they're going to have a, a, a huge impact. Um, I I think that the, that the point that was made by um, Akebi that, that you know we. We can't wait for an ideal time before we try to do industrial policy. Uh, we have to we have to try to do industrial policy uh, in the circumstances that we've got, and we have to we have to continue to battle. Now, why do we have these uh, policies in place? I think they re- they re- they reflect the uh, the needs, demands, and interests of 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 uh, um, you know a, a globally integrated financialized uh, financial system. And um, I think that's the that's the reality. So we have to back up for a, 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 an alternative uh, uh, way through. Uh, and um, uh, as long as these, uh, and, and uh, there is of course the the other point that, that was made uh, that uh, uh, it does mean that budgets were cut. Now, in the case of of, of South Africa, some um, uh, some analysts have pointed out that actually the budgets for industrial policy programs were also cut. So I think that this must mean uh, um, uh, something that 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 is, uh, is 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 significant as well. But I, I just think that generally, you know, when it comes to things like um, uh, ex- the exchange rate and the um, inflation targeting and stuff like that, uh, it's it's extremely important that actually the 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 demands and the needs of industrial development come in. And I think that the politics of this is 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 made more difficult by the fact that uh, since as uh, industrial sectors are small, the claims and demands of our industrial sector uh, businesses are not as influential and strong in 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 lobby uh, as are the demands of others, uh, and that's a, a, a reality that we 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 have to come to terms with. So I would say that uh, um, yes, macroeconomic policy uh, is, is 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 shaped by uh, the wrong paradigm uh, in many many cases, uh, and that uh, this paradigm, which has been uh, actually uh, applied in a very uneven way, it's not applied by the developed world when it doesn't suit them, uh, but it's foisted on us uh, all the time. 
uh, I think we need to come to terms with uh, uh, a struggle uh, to, 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 to transform that reality as part of the struggle for uh, a, a different kind of uh, development strategy, which is also the, uh, the industrial policy and industrialization uh, path forward. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, would you like to add anything at this stage, Yemi? Thank you, Nikki. I think Dr. Davis has I mean, done justice to the topic. I think he put it very well when he said um, there's a lot of emphasis on achieving stability and meeting certain macroeconomic balances, the focus on debt, the focus on fiscal deficits, um, the focus on managing inflation, sometimes to the detriment of the real sector. Um, so I, I really don't have much to add. I'll just take the opportunity to talk a bit more about the AFCFTA, which you had asked me to do, and to say that the AFCFTA, we must look beyond using it for mere trade liberalization and more uh, to deepen industrialization in the continent by offering wider markets, markets that enable backward and forward linkages and the development of a regional value chain. So I think it's critical um, with, that we see it in that way rather than as uh, it was very elegantly put by Dr. Davis there, uh, providing a wider market for other uh, non-regionals um, looking for uh, opportunities for transshipment. So I, I do believe um, it offers that opportunity and it's something that we can do uh, quite well by giving the right package of coordinated incentives, um, for instance, um, incentives for companies that choose to work together across the African continent as opposed to um, those with linkages um, with other parts of the world. And also to help improve the payment systems uh, within the uh, continent. I think uh, trade is hampered by the fact that very often you have to first get a convertible currency uh, in order to pay for the goods that you are in, um, importing and, 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 and vice versa. So I think having a payment system that backstops the African continental free trade area is something that we should pay a great deal of attention to as well. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I see we have run a bit over time. I think we'd like to just take one more round of the questions that are coming through on the chat, if you'll permit us. Uh, so we'll carry on for about another five to seven minutes or so. Um, I would like to, unfortunately, Professor uh, Prof. Alkeba had to leave for another engagement. But the, the one uh, question in the chat said, um, again, on the AFCFTA, I wonder how much national industrial strategies really take account of the AFCFTA and whether all countries can use the AFCFTA in the same way as they all seek the, um, to improve the value-added conditions in their own countries. So it's, I, I guess it's kind of if everybody's trying to move up the regional value chain at, at the same time, is there really scope for this, for coordination, if so, by whom? Uh, we've partly uh, discussed that, but if uh, further comments, um, if you'd like to make further comments, let me just read the next question. How does the current conflict between Russia and Ukraine, read the West, mean for Af sorry, how does the current current conflict between Russia and Ukraine, read the, the West, mean for Africa with regards to Africa's economic development as we head towards a new Cold War? especially considering our relations with China and India. Uh, and then from Farai, how can we ensure that regional value chain development, which requires lead enterprises, not, does not lead to more unequal development, that's related to Bruce's point, as such enterprises are likely to come from relatively more developed countries on the continent? All right, so uh, if I could ask uh, Rob Davies to give a brief input and then I'll hand over to Yemi. Yeah, so first of all, on the uh, continental free trade area, I, I did uh, specifically say it was one of my things that um, I, I don't think that this is yet the current practice uh, of, uh, of looking to uh, the uh, continent as a way of uh, the continental free trade area as a way of creating inclusive growth uh, that uh, is um, bringing uh, value chains would mean that uh, smaller countries would also be involved in some part of the, of the value chain. And it's not just an opportunity for the bigger economies to just be dumping uh, their own finished uh, goods. And I, I think that, that uh, 
this needs to be embedded much more in our own national uh, uh, industrial policies as 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 much as uh, uh, anybody else. Uh, uh, I, I think if 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 uh, it doesn't get seen in that way, then we will get a backlash from other countries. And that backlash could well take the form of them insisting on weak rules of origin uh, and uh, the adoption of screw, screwdriver type industries that would uh, uh, take up, take advantage of the, of, the, of the continental free trade area, ultimately not to the benefit of the countries hosting those screwdriver industries, but uh, extra regional forces. So I think it's uh, it's still a work in progress, but I'm encouraged by the fact that I think there's quite a bit of strong political support uh, at the moment for uh, an approach which is uh, saying that the continental free trade area is not uh, just about free trade. It's about uh, using a larger regional African market for deeper structural transformation. I think we need to add all the voices we can to that, uh, that uh, call and uh, get on with the work of, uh, of trying to uh, identify uh, <clears throat> all of the policy inter interventions uh, and the kind of tools that we can deploy uh, to try to, to, to bring this about, uh, starting with the priority areas, but also I think uh, bringing in other uh, sectors as well. On the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict, I, I, I think I already mentioned that I think it's, uh, it must be in Africa's interest to see uh, an early conclusion to that war and, uh, and, and, and some kind of, uh, I think, balanced uh, outcome uh, of that conflict, um, which I think uh, has its uh, uh, clear um, origins in um, uh, you know, uh, Western Russian um, uh, uh, strategic uh, contestation. Um, the longer that war goes on, I think, and the longer all the um, uh, uh, various other things related to that war, uh, sanctions and whatever, um, go on, uh, the more damage is going to be done uh, to, um, uh, you know, um, go global supply chains, but not in ways that are going to uh, assist us in any, in any way, but actually going to make it more difficult for us. So I think that, uh, you know, we, we haven't recovered from the, from the COVID. Uh, and now this is a, this is another um, external shock. So I think that's the first point I'd make. The second point, though, is that we are clearly moving into a world uh, which has seen the demise of the unipolar neoliberal triumphalism of the 1990s at the end of the Cold War, where uh, the world, according to the uh, United States of America and its uh, policies and institutions, uh, was the only name in the game uh, in town and where everybody was singing from the same uh, hymn sheet. I think that neoliberalism is definitely not dead uh, when it comes to uh, the actual uh, real policies that have been foisted on us, but uh, its capacity to try to uh, forge a global consensus is clearly undermined uh, and has also been undermined by the actual experience of development of a country like China, uh, which decidedly did not follow uh, neoliberal policies. So I think a new world is being shaped, a new world order has been shaped. Uh, it could be a world order of blocks, which I don't think is what we, we necessarily want, or it could be a world order of, of more multilateralism, uh, which I think is preferable, but also then we have to take up what kind of multilateralism, because I think most of the multilateral institutions that we've had in place have been greatly influenced uh, by uh, the neoliberal world order and uh, clearly need to be reformed in the direction of uh, trying to promote greater inclusivity uh, and development. So I think we need to keep our, our eyes on this and be active players uh, in trying to shape a, a new, much more multipolar and also hopefully more multilateral uh, global world order. Thanks. Thanks very much for that interesting input. And uh, Yemi, would you like to add any further remarks, final remarks, I should say? Yes, thank you. Just very briefly to agree that um, industrial policies would need to be aligned to take account of the African continental free trade area. But to add that there are several other changes taking place as well. We have to adapt to COVID-19. We have to adapt to climate change. We have to take on the digital revolution, which is moving into the 5G era. So there's so much that needs to be done to incorporate our industrial policies. Uh, and I expect that going forward, um, we'll begin to see more of such. The worry about um, having lead uh, companies from the larger 
more developed African countries dominating regional value chains, um, just the way TNCs dominate um, global value chains may be valid, but that need not be the only approach. There's the approach of partnerships as well. I give the example of Nigeria, where um, in the production of fertilizer, um, one, our, fertil our urea producing uh, companies uh, collaborate with a phosphate producing company in Morocco uh, to produce fertilizer, which is blended within the economy by different uh, companies. So it's not necessarily the case that you need to re replicate um, the African uh, multinational as the way of, as the only way of producing and um, promoting regional value chains. I, I, um, on Russia, Ukraine, just to say, yes, we're already feeling the impacts of high commodity prices, the refugees, the impact of on education from the children who have returned. Um, but what we're going to see more and more is intense competition uh, for support from both sides and, um, uh, and the pressure on African countries uh, to try and uh, um, to, to align with one side or the other, which may impact again on the kind of uh, resources that are available to undertake development. I leave it there. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was fascinating as well. Um, so, would you like to make any uh, final remarks before I close and say thanks? Um, no, I think we can go straight to closing. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks All for right. sharing. Um, a lot of people to thank. Uh, thanks, of course, to uh, Saul for all the hard work that, that he's done on setting up the alumni network and Christian Kabongo, who could not be with us. Uh, thanks very much to everyone for attending and thanks to our wonderful speakers for the fantastic input. I felt like we could have carried on um, discussing and moving on to w, the reform of the WTO and so on. It could carry on for another half an hour. But uh, unfortunately, we have to stop. And then I'd like to also say a, a, a big thank you to Rosal and the TIPS team behind the scenes for um, uh, making the uh, technology work and, and keeping us, us going. Uh, we will post the presentations and the recording of the event on the Apple website. And we've sent, uh, put the link in the chat. All right. So thanks very much for attending, everybody. And um, that's all for now. Thank you.